question automatically arises, who is responsible? Uh, and that has been for the peace movement, for the anti-war movement as well, a very difficult and trying question. And the discovery of who is responsible is in part a function of political consciousness as in, and is in part a reflection of our own maturity through the development of, of an understanding of, of the nature of power and, and who controls that power in our society. One of the contributors to an understanding of that problem is the next speaker, uh, Professor G. William Domhoff from the University of California at Santa Cruz, author of uh, the uh, text, Who Rules America, and author also of the uh, less well-known book, uh, C. Wright Mills and the Power Elite. Uh, Professor Domhoff will speak on the question of the foreign policy establishment. We oppose the government. Professor Domhoff. In these brief few minutes, I want to talk on how and why the power elite makes foreign policy. <clears throat> Since this presentation is very short, it will consist mostly of assertions. That is, I will not be able to describe in detail the methods by which I arrive at the statements I make. I will not present all the evidence that I very easily could present and I will not uh, be able to burden you with a great many supporting footnotes and, and references. Now, I, I want you to know that this is the most uncomfortable situation for an academic to be in, because we like very much to cover ourselves, to be temperate, reasonable, confusing, and unconvincing. Now, <coughs> apologies aside, I will try to show that the power elite make foreign policy in this country, and I will tell you exactly how they do it. And at the close, I will say a word or two about why they do what they do, which is very easy to know if you know how they do it. I define the power elite as the operating arm of the American upper class. It is the group of people that keeps two-tenths of one percent of the American people owning 22 percent of all American wealth that's privately held and 65 to 70 percent of all corporate wealth. It also keeps this small group of people enjoying the good things that wealth can buy and command. Jet set parties costing seventy-five to hundred thousand dollars, debutante balls costing a couple hundred thousand dollars, keeping horses who eat enough and need enough care in a year that takes more money than most people make in a year. The point is very simply, and no radical statement should ever begin without it, that the people that have wealth in this country are very small. The rest of us have education, expertise, our reasonable and sensible judgment and our good name, and we can last about three weeks uh, without our salary, which explains a good deal why everybody keeps their place uh, in the system. Anybody that doesn't is an individualist and a martyr and suffers from an overly uh, developed superego. And if you understand Lenny Bruce, uh, he said very simply, if you want to be a man in this system, uh, you sell out. Anything less than that is a little crazy if it's not part of a movement. Uh, morals aside, not all members of this privileged upper class, this ruling class, are involved in ruling. I talk to many every day that don't have the slightest idea how the system runs. But the fact is that some few very important members of this class are involved in running the system, and they do so in conjunction with carefully selected employees. And they are the ones that make the big decisions. They are the ones that head this country in certain directions. It is not a function of their personality. It is not a function of LBJ's boorishness. It is not a function of Eisenhower's stupidity or any little accidents along the line. Uh, these decisions are made by moderate, pragmatic, smart, given the system, men with the absolutely best academic advice that can be bought. I'm not trying to say they're geniuses. I'm just trying to say that they're every bit as smart as we are, and they know everything that we can figure out, these men have figured out. And this is the difference, and you'll meet members of the ruling class that don't know up from down, but you'll also meet members of the ruling class that are very, very sophisticated about this system. And I'm going to tell you how they get sophisticated. And I'm going to do it particularly in terms, of course, of foreign policy. How do they do it on foreign policy if they do it? I'm always glad to do this on the Berkeley campus because the wonderful pluralists always chuckle at me and say, well, how do they do it? It's a big joke and have a big giggle. And Polsby writes, he doesn't tell us a thing about how the system works. This is how it works on foreign policy. 
Polesby doesn't know it, so you can tell him in class tomorrow. Now, very simply, what happens on foreign policy is that they, meaning the power elite, work through certain intermediary uh, organizations, which are financed by their corporations and foundations. And by foundations, you almost always mean Ford, Rockefeller, and Carnegie. The most important of these foundations are these or intermediary organizations are essentially three. First, the Council on Foreign Relations. Second, the Committee for Economic Development. And third, I like to mention the Brookings Institution because my present boss is a retired head of the Brookings Institution. And I think he always likes me to mention it. His name's Robert Calkins, and he's the head of the uh, social sciences at Santa Cruz. Now, who are these groups? First of all, very simply, they are the big rich, the corporate leaders, and their academic advisors. That is the personnel of these groups. What do they do? Very simply, they get together in various ways and discuss how best to deal with their problems. Now, sometimes this involves luncheon meetings in New York where speakers are brought in, where everybody important that goes to New York always goes by the Council on Foreign Relations. But most important, this involves groups, discussion groups of 20 to 25 men. And these groups get together to discuss a question, Russia, China, nuclear policy. Who is, who is in these groups? Well, they're led by maybe four, five, or six academics. The finest you can buy is to repeat. And then you'll find in the group various big corporate leaders. And they will discuss a given question. One of my friends uh, who served as an informant for me, as well as my more academic understanding of this, explained a group from the early 50s. He was in a group on sort of the revolutionary potential in Russia. And in this group was J.J. McCloy of Chase Manhattan, Ford, and many other pursuits, Devro Josephs of the Morgan Empire, uh, Dean Rusk, who was then just a, a petty sort, and Averill Harriman. Oh, I was stunned when he told me this, because it's almost textbook in terms of our paranoia as who was there. There were other, there were other businessmen there. Uh, there's a representative from State Department, and then there's a representative from the CIA, Robert Amory, Cleveland Amory's uh, not-so-funny brother as, as Cleveland is. And with the help of various people from Columbia and Harvard and so on, they discussed what the chances were for a little change in Russia. And uh, the conclusion of the group was much that, uh, that the academics said there wasn't much chance for the kind of change that Americans would like to see, and, and the CIA uh, concurred. Now that's where it happens. My buddy also wrote at that time a little report saying it'd be crazy to hold an election in Vietnam. He's a, he's a good pluralist, this guy. I almost jumped out of my chair and I grabbed him and I said, well, did, did Averill Harriman hear it? Did McCloy hear it? He said, yeah, they heard it. I said, what, what did they say? He said, well, they didn't say anything. They just listened. And he said, I, I said, do you think that's how that word got to Ike? He said, I don't know. Anybody that would have studied it at that time would have known that you should never hold uh, such an election and so on and so forth. I said, well, God, this is a perfect case where I can actually see policy generated and go right on. He said, well, I can't, I don't really know anything more uh, about it. Well, it, you know, we got pretty close that time, but, you know, everybody has a little piece of the action, a little piece of the system. Kissinger ran one of these study groups in the late 50s, same sort of personnel, CIA, State Department, big corporate leaders, and they discussed uh, nuclear weapons. It was a rather impressive uh, sort of, of book that came out of it. Is this all a conspiracy? Like Dan Smoot says it is, Dan Smoot taught me all this, and I always like to point that out because I have learned more from Dan Smoot than any uh, political scientist in this country. <laughs> and, but the thing is that Dan Smoot thinks it's all a secret conspiracy, uh, which is sort of tragic because he learned about it in Harper's Magazine and from their annual reports. The important thing, though, is that these are consensus-seeking organizations. It's in these organizations that the leaders of the ruling class the power elite meet and discuss and, and become sophisticated. They are consensus seeking. They are not conspiratorial. They'll send you their annual report. The academic community will not study the Committee for Economic Development. They have to hire their own historian to brag. They have two books out now by Carl Schriftgeiser. He's the only one that studied them. Uh, they want to let everybody know that they aren't like the NAM, that they're liberal. They're corporate liberals in new left term. But they have to brag about themselves. You can't get anybody to study them. I always like to use this particular example because it gives us a chance to discuss conspiracy because that's a, l a word that uh, ties up with paranoid, which many political scientists learned about in their introductory abnormal psych course. And everybody knows that paranoids, they see plots and so on and so forth. And it's a wonderful thing to pin on a guy to call him a paranoid, call him conspiratorial, and that's the end of, of the argument. And uh, it, it gives us a chance to then 
deal with this. Because, of course, it's not a conspiracy in that sense. Uh, these people do it in the open. They'll send you their, their um, book. The main thing is that why you don't know about this organization is that nobody cares. The American people, most of them are getting theirs. As long as they're getting theirs, they're not going to look uh, very hard. The second organization I'll just mention very quickly is the Committee for Economic Development, formed uh, about 1942 by people that were essentially scared that there would be a post-war depression. Again, discussing with carefully selected economists, they uh, learned about the system. Seven of the eight top people in the Marshall Plan came directly from the Committee for Economic Development. I have a favorite story about the committee. Uh, it concerns the Alliance for Progress. You could read the whole chapter in Schlesinger's book on a thousand days, and you would think that Schlesinger started the Alliance for Progress. But uh, I happened upon the fact that uh, maybe CED was involved in this, and I wrote to them, and they said, you're darn right. We wrote a report that was very similar to what's the Alliance for Progress, uh, because some of the same people worked on our report that worked on uh, the Kennedy report. But you would never know that uh, from reading uh, Schlesinger. You would never know from reading Raymond Bauer and Ithel de Sola Poole in their book on, on uh, American business and public policy, uh, which is about uh, uh, lowering tariffs, free trade. You would never know that they were in a Council on Foreign Relations study group which talked about this whole thing. You read their book and it's just sort of a miracle that uh, the business community is suddenly uh, no longer isolationist. You wouldn't know that the Committee for Economic Development, the Council on Foreign Relations, have been pushing this whole change uh, for 30 years. Where do these people get their academic expertise? Where do they get so clever about the system? Well, they first of all get them from scholars at certain institutes. First of all, I would say at Harvard, MIT, Columbia, and Princeton, and a few strays in the hinterland, such as at Berkeley, and that was spelled out in pretty good detail this morning, and it's in a, and it's in a pamphlet that... Uh, radical students or whatever are going to make up. Point is, that's a very nice case example of, of wh what happens and where these academics, these certain academics are, are housed. Uh, they then go and, and perform for the Council on Foreign Relations or, or for the Committee for Economic Development or for sundry other groups that, that I uh, could mention. These scholars are secondly housed at the RAND Corporation uh, where people are lured with very high salaries and often given half their time free to do whatever they want. So I have a friend that works at RAND. He's a statistician, and they make him work half-time, and he gets to play his own games on their fancy computers uh, the rest of his time. A third group, uh, mentioned it already, where academics are housed and where Polsby put in a little of his postgraduate time. I don't have a thing about Polsby today or anything. Uh, was the Brookings Institution. They, they, the corporate rich, not only discuss there, but they also house a great many uh, academics there. These scholars are so close to the power elite that they cannot see it. They are, in many ways, almost part of it. They don't have to be given cut in with big dough. They are so utterly flattered that they are important. How can a, how could there be a power elite when a Jewish boy like me from the middle class can be giving advice to the President of the United States? Now, how does all this stuff get into the government? Basically, what I've told you and what I can support to the point of boredom is that the same rather small group of people sit on certain foundations, run certain corporations, go to the Council on Foreign Relations, interact with, uh, run the same, run, of course, they also run the, uh, the universities, and the best one guy here, if I had to pick a guy, is Bill Roth, who is the, uh, one of the trustees of the region. He's a member of the Committee for Economic Development. He runs Mats and Lines. He sits on foundation. He's the guy that negotiates the Kennedy round. And he's the guy, when he comes to the Santa Cruz campus, that shows up at the debate. And you've got to get to the left of him, not Reagan, if you're ever going to uh, do anything, because he's pretty cool. Well, the point is this. The way this stuff gets into the government is through special commissions and task forces, first of all. They set up a commission on raw materials. They set up a commission on the budget. They set up a commission on the Alliance for Progress. But the key thing is this. Who are the men on these commissions? They are the same men that have already discussed the question of the Council on Foreign Relations. Of the key things that met in the key commissions of the 50s, five of the six guys were from the CFR, and the sixth guy was from the CED. The same academics that have already discussed it in a CFR discussion group now discuss it and make it a government report. So if a pluralist wants to study how policy is made, all he has to do is get the reports of the Com Committee for Economic Development and the Council on Foreign Relations, compare them with these various commissions. Compare with what, what, what the commission, Rockefeller Commission, the Point Four Commission, and so on. Compare it with what they've been saying in CFR for a lot of years. Compare the new budgeting system with what the CED has been pushing through several different of its commissions and programs for uh, several years. 
That's how they get into, a gov into the government, and you can watch it move, paper by paper. The whole country's loaded with mimeographed handouts. Read the CFR and CED stuff and compare it with these uh, reports that uh, are made to the National Security Council and to various government uh, departments. Of course, they secondly get into the government because they're the guys that are appointed to the government. Theodore White, in his, one of his Making of the Presidents, tells about the fact that the list of names, of 80 names that were handed to Kennedy for possible appointments to a State Department position 60 or 65 or something like that, were from the Council on Foreign Relations. This is another function of the Council on Foreign Relations. This is where you learn about how to be a good government uh, uh, employee. This is where the other cats learn whether the guy's cool or not. This is where I can answer A.A. A. Burley Jr. He said, oh, that's all very nice. Uh, Mr. Domhoff, but uh, if they didn't, if they don't rep elect their own leaders, you can't call them an elite. They're just a collection of individuals. He said, you might as well, you might as well say that the guys that go to the Yale Harvard football game run the country. Ha ha. Uh, <laughs> well, the point is that this is where you learn who's who's got some sense, who who is really cool. This is where Averill Harriman and J.J. McCloy and Devereux Josephs come to be seen by the rest of the guys as somebody that they want to trust on policy. That's why J.J. McCloy is on every commission and committee, including the Assassination Commission. When J.J. McCloy is on it, it's a clear sign to the clowns in the hinterland that it's all right, because he has thought through it even though they haven't, or at least his advisors have told him. So you see J.J.'s name and you say, okay, must be all right, we can send them a few bucks. He's... Now, it's, it's just incredible, because they obviously couldn't sit on all the, be there for all the commissions that he's on, and the guy that wrote one of the books on the, on the assassination pointed out that most of the commission wasn't there uh, very often. Well, so these people appointed, they're appointed then uh, to the government, the McBundys, the, the Bundys, the Kissingers, and so on and so forth. That, my friends, is a closed circuit. That is the way foreign policy is made. The only input into that system is what the hell is happening overseas. Very little input from Americans, only when things really, really get heated up. And on that point, even the pluralists admit this. And they admit in this country there is a foreign policy elite, never, of course, tying this foreign policy elite to the corporation. If you want to read the latest pathetic example of this, you read a book by Arnold Rose called The Power Structure, which has two grand pages on foreign policy and manages to say that foreign policy is made by an elite at the Council on Foreign Relations, which has nothing to do with the business community, which is out of it, and he then cites the Chamber of Commerce. That's about where most pluralists are with the business community, with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and National Association of Manufacturers. And they're about 40 years out of date, which is about where the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is when it gets up against these moderate elements within its own family. Even the pluralists admit that public opinion has virtually no effect on foreign policy, that the foreign policy elite manipulates public opinion on foreign policy uh, as much as it is shaped by it. My sources here are, uh, in particular, a guy named Rosenau, and he has a recent book that he's edited that uh, suggests this very nicely. Well, finally, a word on why they do what they do, because I know they do it. Just read the history of the Council on Foreign Relations. Just read Schriftgeiser's two books on the Committee for Economic Development. Just read their reports, and you will know why they do what they do. You will know what concerns them, what bugs them. And the first point is an old one. They need markets, and they've known this for a long time. Uh, only a few people knew it at first from the turn of the century, but by the late 30s, early 40s, there was getting to be a terribly strong consensus on this. And so from the National Planning Association on the left to the Brookings Institution, to the Committee for Economic Development, to the 20th Century Fund, which is headed by the multimillionaire Burley, on over to the Council on Foreign Relations. They all understood that they had to get overseas. In the words of Dean Acheson, we either find some more markets or we're going to have regimentation here at home. We're not going to be able to produce enough products and we're going to have to change the whole American system. We can't be free and flexible and so on anymore. And th this is what you learn in these particular uh, reports. Oh, you learn something about raw materials and other minor aspects uh, of this. And I would point out that if you would read these histories very carefully and these organizations very carefully, what you would learn that would be sort of stunning is that all of this really happened then long before the dirty red menace really loomed in a, in a really serious fashion in 45 and 46 when the Cold War supposedly all began and, and so on and so forth. Which then brings up the whole interesting question of the Daniel Bell thesis about how all American foreign policy is this defensive response to the, to the Red Menace. Well, in conclusion then, what I'm saying is that why they do this is that they need what they call 
overseas trade. I guess that the other people have another word for it, and they call it imperialism. Thank you. Let me lead off with a uh, short question. Uh, if you could try to tie up a little better the uh, thesis at the end, uh, the need for markets to the kinds of uh, mechanisms for making foreign policy. Uh, for example, um, do you see the academic advisors in the Council of Foreign Relations and so on uh, quite conscious of this kind of need that operates uh, in uh, the power elite. Do you see them uh, trying to plan with those who do seek foreign markets, foreign policies that will further that need? Yeah, yes, I do. And here I should be more specific. And I think this is very clearly some people and not others. And I think, it's, I, and I think frankly, it would be rather easy to, to, to spot them. And I think that... Uh, you as students and, and new leftists in your um, attacks and criticism of the university and so on should sharpen in on, on a focus on this because it's really very easy to pick, pick the people out and then work from it. I, I think I'll give you an example from a letter I got from Heilbronner uh, and we, we were exchanging information on this and I sent him a longer paper on this same thing and he said, now I know many guys that work at the Council on Foreign Relations. Some of them are really more liberal than this and, but they have a sense of just how far you can sort of push these guys. In other words, these guys sound, his friends, sound so conscious that, the, that they feel, well, it's the only place where you can get any leverage on the system, and, and maybe if we can just sort of move them a little bit at, at a time. I mean, this is the way uh, some of them think. But now my friend that, that was involved in it, uh, he is strictly a, a political scientist. He's strictly a student of communism, and I don't think he looks at it in the economic sense. But I will say this in answer to your question. Uh, some recent work that I've done on the corporate, how they make domestic policy, which is sort of similar, except public opinion plays a tremendously greater role in pressuring them. That's where you really see the role of the economists and, that, and, and, and some really sophisticated economists. For instance, Calvin Hoover of Duke was one of the people that helped these people on, on uh, uh, fr free trade. And the guy that was uh, the former head of the American Economic Association that's always saying something at, at Harvard, his name now escapes me. Uh, he, he is always, he's written on the corporation and so on. It's mild repression. He, he, uh, he's always giving them advice and so on. I think those people are terribly sophisticated about the needs of the system. And the point about Bill Roth is, he's not only trained at some sophisticated university by these people, but he now can be taught by them. They taught, for instance, Hoover and those guys taught him the stabilized budget concept, that how to use the budget and so on. And, 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 and so they've really made them a terribly sophisticated uh, sort of a group. This goes all the way back to the turn of the century with John R. Commons and his friends. All of the political economists of that time, the new economists, were involved with various power lead organizations and thought they were good guys. Uh, could I just follow that up with one other quick question? Uh, don't you think that uh, it's a little too simple to reduce it all to this uh, economic uh, uh, interest? What about the increasingly powerful role of the military with its own interests? that are not simply to be, I, and, and I'm asking this as a question, I'm implying a, a conclusion, uh, yeah. to be reduced to uh, their concern for, with the corporations for the corporations' profits. Isn't the military and the various services, rival interests, uh, an increasingly critical factor in the determination of foreign policy? Well, gee, I, you know, I got to admit that I, I don't think so, and I've Franz and I discussed this once, and, and uh, the only people I can quote, though, is all the people that I badmouth, you know, like Samuel Huntington and, and uh, Janowitz and so on and so forth. But, but my basic point on that, very frankly, is from looking at the defense companies, and true, they're terribly important, but when you look at who the investment bankers are and who the people are and who sits on the boards of Lockheed and Boeing and so on and so forth, uh, if you look at the fact that Ford and General Motors and all of those people are also very big defense vendors, I can make absolutely no distinction in my mind, between the power elite and the military-industrial complex. That's, that's Ike's word for the power elite, in, in, in my estimation, because I cannot see different people running these. I see these people oriented into the same sets of investment houses uh, and so on and so forth. And I still think that in the American system, as it's been for the whole time, I still think the where it's at is with these 
corporate leaders. I just do not think it's with these uh, military people. I do think they follow orders. I do think they have their interests. But I, I don't think like that the war has a logic of its own, so on and so forth. Uh, like on all this dropping the bombs business, uh, they, uh, they, they turn that off the next day. Oh, the military maybe can do little sabotages along the way and so on. But I just don't see those people as uh, controlling the policy. I agree with Samuel Huntington, who's at one of these institutes that I just badmouth. That is, military's conservative. They don't want to start, they don't want to go to Vietnam. They don't want to start bombing. Once they bomb, they don't want to stop bombing and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so I frankly, uh, you know, I think that you know, I think to go to the military, as Mills did in particular, uh, and as some people do now, is to take your eye off, off of the ball. Uh, and I'm not just saying by that that they have economic interests sort of in a Beardian way. I mean, I, I think that the power elite has a whole view of themselves and of, of the American way and the need for free trade and what will happen to the world if the communists get it. I mean, I think they have a whole complex ideology, and I'm not ready to argue that they have some narrow economic interest necessarily in in Vietnam. What I am ready to argue on Vietnam is that these decisions were made in the National Security Council by people who are from the Council on Foreign Relations. And I always find every, you know, for instance, what annoyed me so much with the liberals throughout the Johnson era was to badmouth Johnson, and he was such a hick, and he escalated the war, and his personality, and all of this sort of stuff. And he has an advisory group. So a month after he de-escalates, there's a little article, a secret on how he, why he decided to de-escalate. Well, who was being advised by nine people? three of whom were retired generals, the other six guys who were from Dylan Reed and McCloy and this sort of guy. And they told, after the Tet Offensive, they said, hey, man, that's it. Now, they had, up to then, they'd been telling him, you know, prosecute the war. And he changed. On, you know, that was the end. Uh, so I think that that, that that is where it is. And when I want to watch for a change in American policy, as I've been watching on the China policy, you watch what the Council on Foreign Relations is doing. It's just like a bellwether. So at the turn of the 60s, after writing, you know, the articles in the Foreign Affairs, which is a CFR publication, were never that, there weren't very many on China, and they, weren't, they were basically talking military things. All of a sudden, around the turn of 1960, the Ford Foundation gave $900,000 to the Council on Foreign Relations to start doing China studies. J.J. McCloy was then, I think, head of both groups, which made it fairly an easy, both Ford and the CFR, made it a fairly easy exchange. And they start getting all of the China scholars hopped up and bringing them there to do the... Uh, um, these study groups and writing books and all this sort of thing. Pretty soon, Council on Foreign Relations is holding public opinion surveys in Chicago and San Francisco. And pretty soon, you'll be Humphrey is saying, well, I never said that our policy remained forever the same in China. And on and on it goes. And they're now trying to modern, you know, they're trying to play little games with China. So I frankly watch those reports. They, to me, they are the bellwethers. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that if CFR says it, that's it, because there's also people in the National Planning Association. And I should say, too, that there's sort of a right-wing drag to this group, the National Association of Manufacturers sort of mentality. And they have a heck of a time with them. They have almost as much trouble with them as they do with the, the radical left. As one of their spokesmen put it, he says, our problem is the anarchists on the right, by which they mean the NAM and the small business, and the socialists on the left. Now, this is a statement from, from 1905 or so. But that's been the level of their sophistication, the people that run the system, I think, for a very long time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Jeez, that's you know somebody somebody wrote a story. That, that the point is that that sort of thing happens. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised this guy was some academic advisor to one of these groups and has seen it in action. Uh, and he's seen the sort of mentality of the people, and and he's a little shocked by their morality and and their all business point of view and their rational calculation of possible losses and this and that and so on and so forth. Uh, the funnest thing of it is to read the reviews of it that appeared in Transaction, and because it really annoyed certain members of the uh, of the higher levels. The guy from Rand Corporation was just about flipped out over the book. He thought it was the most outrageous, incredible thing uh, in the whole world. Incidentally, one of the things you learn from uh, reading about the Council on Foreign Relations and so on is there's only two things in this country that really scare these people. One's a third party, and the other's isolationism. And the proper policy, the new left I now propose, is to absolutely adopt Dan Smoot's position on, on uh, foreign policy. J.J. McCloy is an un-American. He's overseas. David Rockefeller is an un-American, just like the Dan Smoot says. And demand total isolationism on foreign policy. That, this would wreck him. 
not to try to make a fancy distinction between American aid overseas and, the, and, the, and that other imperialist organization, the Peace Corps, and so on. Absolute isolationism. This would, and basic reason for the strategy is that it bothers the power elite so much. They're, really, they're just totally afraid right now. This guy Zabrinsky or whatever his name is, that's, uh, he's with their Institute for Russians or whatever it is at Columbia. He's writing the same guff now that he wrote after the Korean War, and that is, the danger of withdrawing from Vietnam is that the American people might go back into this grand isolation again, and we would never be able to be international anymore. In other words, they're scared to death that a Vietnam experience will make isolationists out of Americans. They were afraid of that after the Korean War, and their fears were unfounded, of course. Um, but they do have this tremendous dread of, of isolationism. It's a great, solid uh, rock of a position. And it also confuses the right wing enormously. Yeah. Yeah. Well, sure. I mean, see, at this point, we're talking about a world of, of things we don't know about. I mean, we talk about a bunch of people that know each other in a million different places. For instance, I happened upon the fact that, that um, Gates, the, the Secretary of Defense before McNamara, he knew McNamara. He knew McNamara because they were fellow trustees, uh, directors of Scott Paper Company. I mean, they know each other in a million different contexts. There are, incidentally, committees on foreign relations in 30 major cities in this country, and they send speakers out to the hinterland. So there, there's a group in various cities, I forget whether San Francisco has one, uh, where they meet and discuss. I mean, this is not, incidentally, the same stuff as that insipid creature called the Foreign Policy Association and, and the World Affairs Council, which is just a finky little organization run by the same people to get you as middle class people involved in discussing foreign affairs, very important. You go down and some inane person in the State Department comes and lays it on you with this fancy stuff, and then somebody gets up and tells you how wonderful the United Nations is and so on. I mean, that's a different organization. That's a, that's a uh, opinion in, influencing organization. Well, but the point is they know each other in a million different contexts, and I can't even begin to guess exactly why David Packard was picked for that job, whose friend he is, whose buddy he is, what, exactly what policy lines he follows, and so on and so forth. I mean, we've got to be careful on that because they're all chums. They're all chums with everybody else uh, and from a million different ways. Yeah. 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 I just don't know that economic detail, and I also want to know who their bank, their uh, bankers are, because w where this really would often runs through is through Dylan Reed and and houses such as that, Lehman Brothers, and so on. When the Democrats are in, Lehman Brothers is big, and Lehman Brothers uh, is in on the financing of of many of these avant-garde space and nuclear science outfits. The Rockefellers do a lot of of uh, financing into these advanced technology things, and so on and so forth. Um, so it, it, it gets very tricky. The Texas group is, is you know, financially involved with some groups. In, I mean, it's sort of like every group has sort of an outpost or friends in New York. I think it's very com complicated within the group, and, and I don't think we should pretend to know that we know exactly what's going on within the group. And I do, in terms of one question over here, I get very uncomfortable when I get too sort of economic-y about it, you know. Uh, that is, you know, sometimes it is obviously some company involved or some group of companies, but... I prefer to, to emphasize the fact that, they, have a, that they, have a, they are the corporate rich. They are the owners and managers of the large corporations that uh, control the wealth of this country and make the major decisions. I think some of them graduate to a systems consciousness. They, they advance beyond an interest consciousness. They become systems conscious. A guy like Bundy. Well, Bundy's from a very rich and old family. But you can't tie him with any specific corporation, but you can tie him with the foreign policy establishment through his father and on back and run all through all of the secretaries of states. But he has a certain view, and he has a, a, a wad of stock and so on and so forth. I don't think he's grinding any specific company's acts. This is a very tricky thing, and it leads to conflict with, often within the power elite, conflicts that are then taken to be pluralism. You know, they say, hey, we've got to control the balance of payments, so what does Henry Ford do? The first thing he does is ship a zillion dollars overseas to buy out total control of British Ford. 
while, uh, while the masses are supposed to be paying a duty on any when they go foreign travel. And, and then they get mad at him. They say, Henry Ford, you know, he's just like a naughty no-no that you've got to, you know, you've got to discipline and get him back in the group. I don't know, because I haven't st studied the Nixon group uh, very well, and they, they are definitely a more, you know, a more cautious uh, bunch within the power elite, a much more conservative element. True, they have Kissinger of the Council on Foreign Relations and Rockefeller right-hand man in the uh, uh, administration. True, they have Clifford Hardin, who's not generally uh, identified as a Rockefeller Foundation trustee, and on down the line. But they also have for their second-in-command of one of these Neanderthals from the Hoover Institute and, and so on and so forth. So that they have a much more cautious group that that democratic elements within the power elite don't have any, any allegiance to. So I just can't guess, although I must say that my, my basic point would be that there's a consensus that develops in, in the Council on Foreign Relations group that they're not going to go too far beyond. Uh, an upper-class uh, journalist, um, Joseph Kraft, who, who wrote about the Council on Foreign Relations, he's also a member, he made the point, he says, the Council on Foreign Relations provides a nice bridge when there's a changing of the guard in Washington. There's not that much difference in foreign policy, even though Galbraith goes around and gives speeches about the three stages in American foreign policy since, since World War II. It's the most incredible speech ever heard. And you get, God, dramatic differences, you know, about like every five years it flip flop. It's not only not true, but the same guys are running it. They don't even die. They don't even die. They, they start out when they're 60 and they're now all 80 and they're the same guys running it. True, they've moderated a little. They, they changed with the winds. Things happen, you know. China and Russia, you know, have their differences. Cuba happens. You know, and they react to this, but basically they are pretty pragmatic sorts of guys. Pretty pragmatic. So I get, I go to a meeting, and a Marxist stands up, and he can't stand it. And he said, "The policy of the United States of America is genocide in Vietnam and genocide in the ghetto." And this was two years ago. I said, "I'm sorry. I've read, the, I've read the Council on Foreign Relations report. I don't think their policy is genocide in either place. Their policy is carrot and stick, which is always their policy. They run up the big guns. They always dangle a dam. You know, in Vietnam, they dangle a few dams. In the ghetto, they dangle this. And their policy, they're going to be out there co-opting. They're going to fire their foundations in there and so on. I said, I don't think there's going to be a long, hot summer. And I think that they'll get out of Vietnam. And I incidentally, I still think they'll get out of Vietnam. And I think Hayden's last points were right. But the Vietnam are giving us the cover to get out. All we need is time to let the American people get cooled off about it so it's not seen as a disastrous defeat. They will let some sort of a government get set up, and they just hope it doesn't collapse into communist hands for five years until it's out of our hands. That's my view of it. I might be wrong, but I am willing to make that guess on the basis of reading their stuff. They are damn proud of the fact of what happened in Indonesia. When Johnson abdicated, that's what he said. He said, we, you know, Indonesia, fifth largest country in the world. They've got their bases in Thailand. They've got their Indonesia back, and they feel they've got Vietnam in circle. Plus, Scalapino has told them a hundred times, it must be through their head, that North Vietnam, Vietnam is a fairly unique thing in terms of this long history of fighting imperialists, you know, whether they're Chinese or whatever. And I think, you know, I think they'll f finally believe old Scalapino, you know, and they don't, and they don't have a falling dominoes view anymore. Uh, and they've solidified their position in, 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 uh, in Southeast Asia. So I think they'll back off a little bit, I really do. I think they're, that's their problem. See, they don't act like the, the Marxists tell us they should. They don't come up tight and let us polarize and all those other words. They keep absorbing you and hugging you and spousing you and, and, you know. True, they spy on Ralph Nader and then they appoint him to a commission on transportation and so on. You've got to get right up next to him. Just that, you got to get right, right up next to him. I, I, that's a whole tricky scene, and I get all the leftists mad at me when I, because I've never been hit over the head, so I don't like to put my opinions forth on that. Thank you.